welcoming Sherston to the platform. All right. So thank you very much for having me. Um, as you just heard, my name is Sherston Perez. Uh, I have a research group that actually works out here at Nevis Labs, as well as uh, a presence on campus at Columbia University. And what we specialize in is developing novel detector technology that can go after the particle nature of dark matter. So the particular way that my group chooses to go after this problem is actually by using the sky as our laboratory. And the photo here is an example of one of these experiments. So this is what it looks like from a detector that is strapped to a balloon about 33 kilometers up off the ground. So I'm gonna start out this talk by summarizing what the sky has taught us so far about what dark matter is and what dark matter is not. Uh, and then I'm gonna summarize some of the experiments that I work on as well as other groups here at Nevis and around the world in order to try and untangle what this strange dark matter is. But before I do that, I did wanna introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so I am a particle physicist. What that means is that I try and study what the universe is made of at its tiniest, most fundamental subatomic scales. As you heard, I started out my uh, career working on the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So this is a five-story monstrosity of a detector that's 100 meters underground and is built to look at some of these tiniest, most fundamental subatomic particles uh, with you know, micron-level precision. And when I showed up, uh, you can see the photo of me here. When I showed up, it was still being built and in fact was covered in scaffolding. And one of my very first jobs when I showed up as a PhD student was to crawl through the instrument and look for wrenches or screwdrivers that had been left behind because this atlas is a giant magnet. And if you turn on a giant magnet and you left a screwdriver inside, you have just punched a hole through your multi-billion dollar experiment. So I really like to show this photo, one, because I look glowingly young in it, um, and two, because I have this look on my face that is just me going, there's no way this is gonna work, guys. Absolutely not. I was wrong, very happy to be wrong. Of course, we discovered the Higgs boson. Um, since then, I, as you heard, I shifted into cosmic particle research or astroparticle physics. So I go after a lot of the same questions that people at CERN are going after, but I'm using particles that are coming from space in order to answer those questions. Um, so I work on three major experiments. The first one is an Antarctic balloon experiment called GAPS that is looking for low energy anti-nuclei as a signature of dark matter. I also work on an experiment called the International Axion Observatory. Uh, this is a telescope that points at the sun and is looking for strange dark matter particles to be made in the extreme environment of the core of our own sun. Uh, and I also work on a variety of different X-ray and MEV uh, ob observations using existing satellites, in particular looking for light dark matter particles like sterile neutrinos and axions. So like I said, these last three uh, experiments uh, are really all using the sky in order to probe something about dark matter. And one of the reasons I like to use the sky to go after this question is because most everything we know about dark matter, we know from looking up at the sky. So let's start at the beginning. What do we uh, see when we observe the sky? So this is Andromeda galaxy. It's our next nearest galaxy neighbor. What you see when you look at this image is of course stars, but also vast quantities of gas and dust. It's brightest in the center. That's where most of the matter is and everything else is rapidly rotating around that center. So before I go on, let's stop for a moment. How do I know all that? How do I know that's what we're looking at? Well, everything we know in astrophysics, uh, most of it comes from photons, light. Basically everything I just talked about either produces, absorbs, or reflects light. Now, some of this light might be in the optical wavelength. That's the part of light that we can see. And this image happens to be an optical image. But of course, we have observatories, telescopes, et cetera, that observe in higher energies or smaller wavelengths or lower energies and lower wavelengths. And those other observatories allow us to measure other things. So for example, dead stars like neutron stars or white dwarfs, you can more easily see in X-rays and higher energies. And things like gas and dust, you get more accurate measurements uh, in infrared or UV, so at the lower energies. And so what we do as astrophysicists is we build detectors, telescopes, observatories that can observe all these different wavelengths of light. Okay, so then what is dark matter? 
Well, that might seem like a natural first question to ask, but first I actually have to step back and say what I mean when I say matter. So at some point back in elementary or middle school, we were all taught that everything on earth is made up of atoms and molecules, that atoms are made up of a nucleus of protons and neutrons, and that is being rapidly rotated by electrons. And honestly, if all you care about is stable matter here in this room, chairs, people, plants, etc., this is pretty much all you need. But as a particle physicist, we know that there is more to matter in the universe. So we know that the electron has some heavier siblings, the muon and the tau. They're a lot like an electron, just a bit heavier. We know the electron, the muon, and the tau have some very light cousins called neutrinos. And we know that the proton and the neutron are in fact made up of constituent particles called quarks. So this, of course, together is the matter content of the standard model of particle physics. And don't want to toot our own horn too much. This is among the most precisely formulated physical theories we have ever written down. One of the ways that I like to think about it is it's as if we had a physical theory that could make a prediction of the distance between where I stand right now and LA airport and get it right, meaning it, it is consistent with measurements to within the width of a human hair. So we're doing a pretty good job on this, but it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain why neutrinos have mass. It doesn't explain why the Higgs boson happens to weigh exactly what it weighs. It doesn't explain why certain interactions uh, among quarks and, and, uh, and, and other bosons happen or don't happen. So we know there's more than just the standard model. Okay, so now I'm ready to answer the question, what is dark matter? So dark matter is matter that is creating gravity in the universe, meaning it's helping the universe clump up into the big scale structures that we see but it is not absorbing, creating, or reflecting light, meaning we can't observe it using our standard astronomical techniques. So even bigger problem here, if you go out and you measure how much of this dark matter is there in the universe, you'll find out that the visible matter is only 20% of what we can see, uh, it, what exists as matter in the universe, and there's four times more dark matter. So one way to think about this problem is to realize that everything we have ever studied as humans on this earth, all of biology, all of chemistry, all of particle physics, all of astrophysics is 20% of the universe. And the other 80%, we don't know what it is. So uh, if this bothers you, <laughs> congratulations, welcome to my world, um, you're a physicist. And we're gonna get into that a little more as I go th further in the talk. But first I want to stop and ask the obvious question, which is if we can't see it, how do we know it's there? And the simple answer is gravity. Like I said, gravity is what holds the universe together. It's what makes it clump up. Gravity is what is holding you down in your chair. It's holding me down on the floor right now. It's holding the earth and other planets in orbit around the sun, and it's holding the sun and other stars in orbit around in galaxies like we were just looking at. And so what you can do is go take an object, say a star that's orbiting around in a galaxy, and you can measure how fast it's going. And then you can look inside that orbit and you can say, well, how much matter is there? Take your telescopes, get all your telescope friends together and weigh how much matter happens to be within that orbit. Again, why are we doing this? Because mass or matter creates gravity and gravity is what holds things together. It's the string that's holding it all together. And so you can go out and you can make this measurement and people have some of the uh, earliest, most precise measurements were done by Vera Rubin uh, in the 1970s. And if you do these measurements, you get something that looks like this. So on the y-axis here, this is how fast stars or objects are moving as a function of distance away from the galaxy. The dotted line is what you expect to measure based on just counting up how much regular matter you see. So that's how fast things should be going. And then the data points, the yellow and the blue is how fast things actually are going. So in essence, what this plot is telling you is that everything in these galaxies is moving way, way, way too fast. It's as if these galaxies should not be held together at all. They should just be flinging apart into space. The analogy I like to use is imagine you have somebody who has a bucket full of bricks, right? 
and imagine they tie it to a rope and they're just swinging it around and around and around. Well, if you were watching someone do that, you would expect to see a very thick, strong rope kind of holding all that together. But what actually you observe is you look at them and it's like there's this tiny little piece of dental floss that's holding the whole thing. And you go, whoa, 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 why is it staying together at all? It should just be flinging apart. So that missing tension, that missing part that's holding everything together is what we call dark matter. Now, these measurements of, of galaxy rotation curves is what they're called, are not the first time that someone thought of the idea of dark matter. Um, the phrase dark matter actually goes back to the 1930s. So this is a scientist called Fritz Zwicky who was looking at um, galaxy clusters. So this was not just looking at a single galaxy, but looking at whole big balls of many, many, many galaxies. And he noticed much the same thing, that the galaxies rotating around themselves in these clusters were moving too fast to be held together. And he said, well, what is it that's holding this together? He called it dunkel matieri or, or dark matter. Okay. Everything I've told you so far, this is a pretty radical idea, right? I am saying that, you know, everything we've ever measured is 20% of the universe and this other 80% that is missing and holding everything together must be this new dark matter thing. So not only is there some new kind of matter in the universe, there's a lot of this brand new kind of matter in the universe. It's not that our measurements were off by a little bit, it's that when we measure the speeds, they're off by a lot. So you can think, hey, why come up with this whole new form of matter? Maybe we just don't understand gravity that well. And maybe we should think about that explanation. So people have done that. Years go by, lots of other observations happen. What you're looking at here, um, this is actually a field of many, many, many galaxies. So each of the bright spots here is actually an entire galaxy. And uh, there was this pretty, pretty smart guy, Albert Einstein. Um, he had a lot of ideas about gravity. So he came up with the idea of general relativity. We've already had to modify our idea of gravity once. And what general relativity does, you know, the way that he thought about gravity was he understood gravity as bending space. And so when we see planets in orbit, that's because the space has bent in such a way that that is bending the way that they travel. Imagine uh, you go home and you look at your sink drain and you see water spinning around and around. That's sort of the way he thought about orbits and, and motion. And not only does this bending of space bend the trajectory of say planets, it also will bend the direction of light itself. So gravity will bend light as it travels, just like the lenses in my glasses are bending the light as they travel towards my eye. And so what this says is if you put some big mass, something that makes gravity, in front of some light, you should see this bending. And so you can go home tonight and actually uh, play around with this whole idea. This idea of gravitational lensing, you can simulate it in your own home by thinking about uh, the stem of a wine glass as a lens. So if you take a candle and you put it somewhere far away and you look at that candle through the stem of a, a wine glass, depending on the orientation of the wine glass, you could see a ring produced by that light or some you know, four dots or maybe two dots or something like that. That's exactly what we expect to see happening from the bending uh, uh, of light by gravity. So Einstein was very smart, but he did not have faith in us experimentalists, I have to say. So if you go to the paper that he wrote where he predicted this gravitational lensing, he says the following. He says, of course, there is no hope of observing the phenomena directly as described in this publication that Mr. Mandel squeezed out of me. So he's basically like, my friend just made me write it down. Uh, it is of little value, but it makes the poor guy happy. But I am very happy to tell you that this is one of the ways that Albert Einstein was wrong. And we do now have the uh, ability to observe exactly this gravitational lensing. So you can go out and make observations and you will see exactly like you expected to see from that wine glass analogy. So you will see rings of light that are essentially what that's telling you is there's a light source back here, some bright galaxy, and there must be something very, very massive between that galaxy and us that's causing that, that ring of light. Or you can see multiple dots and sometimes you get these, these four dots. So this gravitational lensing gives you a way of making a map of where matter exists in the universe that's a little independent of just looking at light through telescopes. And so one of the ways that this map of matter can be really useful um, is in an observation called the bullet cluster. And this is an important observation because it kind of makes 
kind of kills the idea that you can just twiddle the thumbs on gravity to explain what we're seeing in dark matter. So I'm going to show a little video. And there's no there's no volume or anything here. But let's see if I can get my mouse over. So what you're about to see is a cartoon and then it will overlay with the actual observation. What we call the bullet cluster is actually two clusters of galaxies. So imagine each of these balls is a ball of hot gas containing lots and lots of galaxies. And each one of these is embedded in some big halo of dark matter. And what happened between these two clusters is they pass through each other. And well, what happens if you throw a bunch of hot gas at a bunch of hot gas? It hits each other. And when it hits each other, it slows down. So all the hot gas kind of slows down, but the dark matter doesn't. So if you go out and you make an observation, you see, boom, there's all this hot gas that hit each other and slowed down. But now you go out with your gravitational lensing and you say, well, where's all the matter? Where's most of the mass? And it's out front. And I don't want to give anyone a free free ad. So I'm going to come back over here. This is very meta because we're streaming on YouTube and YouTube just got a free YouTube ad on our YouTube stream. Um, OK, so this was this is the nut. Of, of the bullet cluster observation, you have these two clusters that pass through each other and in passing through each other actually separated out where is the normal matter of the of these clusters from where is the gravity it's in front. So finally, one of the last examples for how we know that there is some dark matter in the universe. Um, comes from observations of large scale structure. So I need you to expand your minds big, 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 big. What you are looking at is what we call the uh, cosmic web, or if you zoomed out of galaxies and you zoomed out of clusters and you looked at, looked at how all of these clusters and galaxies and things are connected with each other, you would see structures like this. So what we can do, if you're a theorist or computationally savvy, is you can basically say, um, I'm gonna write down all the rules of physics that we know about how gravity works. And we don't know what this dark matter is, but we think we know how much of it there is. And so let's rewind back to sort of the beginning of the universe and just throw everything together and see how it evolves. How does it clump up? Can we get it to look like the structures we actually observe today? Uh, and the point here is that yes, we can get it to look basically like the structures we have today, but only if you include this dark matter. If you only include the amount of matter that we can observe through standard astronomical techniques, you will not get the structures that we know and love today. And so one of the ways uh, that you can actually measure this large scale clumping back in the early universe is by observations of what's called the cosmic microwave background. Um, so the cosmic microwave background is some of the very earliest light in the universe. And it can tell us about how the universe clumps up on its very, very, very biggest scales. And it's these observations that tell us exactly how much dark matter we have. You know, we have basically four to five times more dark matter than we do standard mo model matter in the universe. Okay, so we know there is some invisible mass in the universe, but the question is, what could it be? Well. We know it can't be the standard model matter that we know and love. And we know this because whatever we're observing out in the astrophysics does not behave observationally the way the standard model matter does. And we know it's not a bunch of heady, heavy, hidden, normal astrophysical objects. So things like black holes or neutron stars, things that are very, very heavy and you might think of as dark, right? Like a black hole, that sounds pretty dark. We actually do know how to observe these things. We know how to go out and look for them. And we just simply do not have enough of them at all to make up what we have measured about dark matter. In addition, it gets a little hard to explain how these things ever clumped up in the first place. If you're trying to make black holes before you actually make large scale structure, it doesn't quite work. And so we're left with looking for some new kind of particle. And what could this new kind of particle be? Uh, well, I frequently say there are as many theories as there are theorists <laughs> working out there right now, and they have lots of fun names. So you have things like WIMPs or weakly interacting massive particles, and that could be a neutralino or an extra dimensional theory or a gravitino. 
You can have things like mirror world dark matter or hidden sector dark matter. You could have dark photons or axions or sterile neutrinos. Basically, there's a lot of different ideas out there. And as I tell my students all the time, as experimentalists, we all want to find dark matter, right? And go to Stockholm and win a Nobel Prize and everyone's excited. Um, but mostly we don't. Mostly we measure zero and we just measure zero better than other people measured zero. And so I tell my students at the end of the day, if you wanna stick in this game right now, you need to fundamentally be happy that your job might be to tell a bunch of theorists that they are wrong. And that is still very, very valuable for where we are right now, because I love to say theorists, stop talking about this thing, let's get more creative, tell me the next thing to go look for that could be dark matter. Okay, so I'm saying that we wanna go out and look for dark matter, but how do we look for invisible matter? I just said we can't observe it through standard astronomical techniques. So how do we observe something that's not absorbing, creating, or reflecting light? Well, thankfully we have three main ways of looking for all these particles. So the first is on the bottom. Those are our particle colliders. So these are experiments that smash together particles that we know and love and study and are looking for new matter to be created. And you hope to see some new matter come out that has properties consistent with what the astronomical observations tell you dark matter is. Another class of experiment is the so-called direct detection experiments. So this is looking for some new dark matter stuff that's floating around and actually crashing through this room all the time to come into our detector and to smash off of our detector. Very rare, but it could happen. The last kind is indirect detection. So this is using the fact that, well, where does dark matter live? Dark matter lives way out there in the cosmos. And just like the particles we do know and love smash into each other and create new mass, these dark matter particles could smash into each other and maybe create the particles we do know how to measure. So indirect detection is the idea that we go out and we make measurements of the particles we do know how to measure, your electrons, your positrons, your protons, your antiprotons, et cetera, and try to use that to understand what kind of dark matter, dark matter interaction processes might be happening way out in space. And one thing I wanna say before I move on is we don't know what dark matter is. Spoiler alert. We do not know. So there is really no one experiment that is going to tell you everything there is to know about dark matter. This is really a team sport where each one of these is telling us a little bit something different about how this dark matter might interact with itself or with other standard model particles. So let's start with a little more detail of the particle colliders. So what you're looking at here is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. For lack of a more elegant expression, it's a giant particle smasher. So it's accelerating protons around this ring, which is about uh, 27 kilometers or 17 miles around. So it's so big, it goes underneath two different countries. So it goes underneath both uh, Switzerland and France. And the reason you need it this big is that you are accelerating these protons to really, 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 really high energies. Basically, they're going really fast. Now, and then what do you do? You smash them into each other. So why do you do this? Um, essentially, you do this because E equals MC squared. If you have a lot of energy in your protons, you can convert that energy into mass which means you could create some new particles. And so this is what's going on uh, in the LHC experiments. They're basically looking for this energy in the protons to be converted into some new mass. Maybe they see some new particle and they can come and say, aha, this looks a lot like what we think we should see from the astronomical observations. The second one is direct detection. So direct detection again, is you're looking for some new dark matter stuff to come smashing into your detector. So these are um, big experiments. Again, this is a fairly rare process. So you basically wanna make your experiment as big as possible. And the cartoon that you have in mind here is you're looking for some new dark matter particle to come in and bounce off the nucleus of whatever it is that you have made your experiment out of. The dark matter particle you don't see, if only it were so easy, we could just see the dark matter particle. But what you do see is this nucleus recoiling off in the other direction. So that's what you're looking for is evidence of, you know, your happy little nucleus just sitting there and all of a sudden it gets knocked over. And you can say, aha, I think that was dark matter coming in. 
Now, the challenge here is, of course, there's lots of particles coming from space all the time. So how do you make sure it's not some other particle coming in and knocking your nucleus over? Um, part of how you do that is you put it really, really far underground. So these are experiments that tend to take place uh, deep underground in mines or, for example, underneath a mountain in Italy, such as the Xenon experiment, which uh, uh, has a lot of development in the building just right down there, my neighbors. The final kind is indirect detection, and this is what my group works on. So the idea of indirect detection is to use the sky as our laboratory. So what do I mean by that? I mean that we have some out in the galaxy, some happy little dark matter particles that smash into each other. And just like E equals MC squared here on Earth, E equals MC squared out there too. So you could create some new particles out the other side. And what you wanna see coming out the other side is something you do know how to detect. So it could make electrons or protons or neutrinos or antiprotons or antineutrons or an antinucleus if those two come together. Or dark matter could decay. It, it's pretty stable, but there's a lot of it. So every, every now and again, you'll get a rare decay. You can get a photon or a neutrino or something like that. So the idea of these indirect detection experiments is to try to measure everything coming out this side in order to tell us something about what's happening on the dark matter side that produced it. So I'm just gonna say a few words about the experiments that I happen to work on, and then we can finish up and I'll, I'm happy to answer some questions. So the first experiment I work on is called GAPS. That's the general antiparticle spectrometer. And what GAPS does is it is a uh, giant particle detector on a balloon. So imagine something like Atlas or CMS, but smaller, and strapped to a balloon that flies over Antarctica. Why Antarctica? I'll leave that as a question to the audience and you can ask me that later if you're still curious. Um, so I find frequently that when I talk about uh, the fact that I take an experiment and I strap it to a balloon and I fly it over Antarctica, people are thinking like, oh, that's cute. I've seen weather balloons. Like it's something that like sits on this table say, you know, it's not that big. So I have to show um, some happy parent photos of exactly how big this thing actually is. Um, so this is a, a photo of the experiment starting to come together uh, in my lab back at MIT. I love this photo because it shows the scale of people next to the scale of uh, this giant beast that is going to hang from a balloon from Antarctica. In fact, it is one of the largest balloon payloads, uh, Antarctic balloon payloads that will have ever been launched. Now, what my group actually did is we helped build the semiconducting silicon detectors that sit at the heart of this instrument. Um, and so, again, we're looking for something very rare. So we need lots and lots of detectors. In fact, we had to make over a thousand of these silicon detectors, and that is what we're going to strap to our balloon and go fly. One of the other experiments I work on is uh, New Star. So this is a satellite, X-ray satellite telescope that already exists. It is flying, it's up in space. It consists of two co-aligned grazing incidence optics. So let me explain what that means. If you know anything about X-rays, you probably know that they don't bounce that well, right? That's why you can have X-rays that come straight through your body. So you can't get an X-ray to bounce like this very, very easily, but you can get an X-ray to bounce at a very, very shallow angle. That's what grazing incidence means. So you can get it to bounce just a little bit. Since you're only getting X-rays to bounce just a little bit, you need these very, very long masks. Uh, so this is a 10 meter deployable mask down onto the actual detectors that detect the photons. And so I use this instrument to look at um, very, very light dark matter particles that could decay into uh, light in the X-ray energy range. And I have to note the connection with Nevis here that these optics were actually built at Columbia University's Nevis Laboratories, in fact, just down, just down the road there. And so then the last experiment that I work on is called the International Axion Observatory. So the International Axion Observatory is looking for rare dark matter particles that are being produced within our own sun. How do we actually detect these? We point a giant magnet at the sun, we convert those particles into photons and try and detect that. So that is the experiment. Take a giant magnet, point it at the sun, look for some X-rays coming where you don't expect X-rays unless it's dark matter. Now, you just heard me say that these are X-ray photons. So where does my group come in? Well, essentially what you need to do is you have a giant magnet and you have little detectors 
So how do I go from a giant magnet, so lots and lots of x-rays down to a little tiny x-ray detector? Boom, I need an x-ray telescope. And so essentially what YAXO is, is take eight new stars and strap it to a giant magnet and point it at the sun. So what my group is doing now is redeploying the facilities that were used to make the new star optics to instead make x-ray optics that can be used for this axion research. And so that is the end of my whirlwind tour through uh, what is dark matter and what is it that I work on. So in, in summary, dark matter is matter that's creating gravity in the universe, but it is not creating, absorbing, or reflecting light. Uh, there is more than four times as much of this dark matter than there is regular matter in the universe. The depressing news is we don't know what it is, but the fun part is that we are looking for it. So that is it. Thank you.